Hour number two now officially underway right here on the Sports Grid Network Series XM Channel 159. I'm Donnie Wrightside. He's Joe Ranieri, and we talk about everything here. The only thing we really didn't squeeze in all that much was the NFL in hour number one. So in hour number two, we get right after it here. How about this? Dak Prescott and the Dallas Cowboys. You might be thinking now, Joe, ooh, what did they do last night? Did they sign the extension? Four more years, $175 million, $100 million guaranteed. Nope, 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 nope. Jerry Jones basically saying, I pay enough money, the results aren't what they need to be, and I'm not extending you down the line because if I feel the need to get rid of you and your head coach at the end of the year, the pressure's on. Let me see you perform. Uh, Listen, the the shot has been fired here, Donnie, and a lot of Cowboy fans are wondering what the hell took you so long Mm -hmm. uh, to begin with here. I mean, the Cowboys and Dak and – Everything they have done, they have changed everything uh, except for Dak, right? Everything else is they've mm-hmm. coaches, uh, coordinators. I mean, they have uh, they have basically changed everything. The only piece left here is Dak. It's either put up or shut up time, but he really is the definition of of mediocrity uh, here. He's a pretty good regular season quarterback, and ultimately figures out ways not to get his team to win a game a la the Philadelphia Eagles just a year ago, Donnie, and you know this. You take a look at the Dallas Cowboys, too, and it starts with Dak Prescott. Like, there are some games here, and watching the regular season, Joe, it's like, man, the Cowboys got so much talent. Dak Prescott looks so good. But in the biggest moments, like, you talk about the playoff run last year. Welcome in the radio audience. You're watching and listening live to the early line on a Wednesday morning edition. Sirius XM Channel 159 on the Sports Grid Network. He's Joe Ranieri. I'm Donnie Wrightside. Talking about the Dallas Cowboys here, you say to yourself, could this be the year? And even last year fell into their laps. The Philadelphia Eagles collapsed at the mm-hmm. end of the season. You even heard Jerry Jones the day, or probably the night after, that the Arizona Cardinals came into Philadelphia and beat the Eagles, which gave the Cowboys the drivers. He's like, I didn't expect this. Like, the expectations now just got ratcheted up. Like, we can actually do this. Then they show up and play the Green Bay Packers and get annihilated on their home field. Like, the door is yep. blown off the place. And then Jerry Jones at the postgame presser before, actually before the postgame presser, everybody line up microphones, say, hey, Jerry, what do you think about it? He goes, you know what? I don't have any answers here. I didn't expect in a million years to be answering a question. We just lost at home in round one in the playoffs when everything was set up for us. I do like the fact that he's holding everybody's feet to the fire, but at the same time, it's almost at the detriment of the Cowboys this year because if he was truly saying before the season, this is going to be an all-in year, I think we can win it. Him having Dak Prescott at a $50 million price tag. Now, granted, a lot of quarterbacks are averaging $50 million a year, but his cap hit is $50 million. You could have easily lowered yep. that down to $30, 25000000 million, signed another running back, a wide receiver, a tight end, a defensive end, a DB. You get the point here. Do you appreciate what the Cowboys are doing by saying it's put up or shut up? Or is this at the detriment of, hey, if we added a couple more players, maybe we could have gotten over the top? But they've done that every year, and look at where they get. It's true. <laughs> they Good get, point. you know, so, I mean, the definition of insanity, right, is to keep doing exactly the same damn thing and expect a different outcome, and in this case, with the same quarterback. So I think at some point the line had to be drawn in the sand where Jerry is going, listen, I have paid enough people on this team enough money that we should be getting more results. We won't be spending any more money on other players, the guys that we have, uh, are good enough and they either perform or they're out. I like the move. It's very un Jerry like. Uh, but the reality is it had to be done at some particular point, And this is the season he's doing it. It's crazy when you line the Cowboys up, too, because, again, if you look at the FanDuel Sportsbook, they're favored to win the division, despite not having that splash offseason that a lot of teams around them are having. Yeah. I do respect what Jerry Jones is doing because – and also when he says, like, oh, you know, I trust the coach and I trust the quarterback. To be honest, Joe, he doesn't trust either one of these guys because it's very mm-hmm. rare that you have a quarterback, again, that you say is your franchise guy – you always kick the can down the road, restructure, 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 pay him more money, but also a lesser number against the cap so you can bring in more players to surround him by. And also for a coach, basically a lame duck. And what are they telling him? It's not even, Joe, like, hey, go out and win 11 games this year. The ceiling is right. if you don't get to the NFC Championship game, you are all gone, which, again, are lofty expectations, particularly for the Cowboys, who haven't been there since the mid-1990s. So if he had trust, Joe, what would he do? Of course, Dak's going to get paid. We're going to extend it down the line. We're going to bring in better football players. Oh, my coach, you don't think I trust him? Here's a new three-year extension as opposed to sending you into your final year. So a lot of things to look forward to the Cowboys this year. And 
I don't know if the pressure is going to be able to meet the punch here because if the Eagles end up winning that division, the Cowboys go nine wins, new coach, new quarterback, and away we go down in Jerry World. But things are changing, Joe, in the NFL, which includes that kickoff rule, which means everybody else, you know, it used to be, does anybody want to return kicks on this team? All right, I'll do it. Third string running back. Why? Because he's never going to get to touch the football as it lands in the seats and through the uprights on the kickoff. But now we're taking a look at a, a play that was out of football primarily for it feels like a decade. You take a look at the Steelers going, you know what? We might have something here. Let's get one of the best return guys over the past five to six years in Cordell Patterson signed to the Steelers. Now, he does meet up, as you said, Joe, early in the show with his old offensive coordinator. But I like this signing here. This might be a new wave in the NFL. Yeah, and I mean, I think he's he's pretty good for uh, Pittsburgh, right? Because we all know yeah. that come uh, come in November, December, January, uh, you, you're going to need a guy like Patterson. He's got a ton of experience. You're going to be bringing in some new guys there. And ultimately, uh, he is uh, he is very familiar with the guy that's going to be calling the plays in the offense. So I think that's it's a good move all the way around for not a whole heck of a lot of money here. So I, I do think Patterson at this point in his career is one of those glue guys that you want in the locker room when, especially when you're bringing in some new changes like a new OC and a new quarterback. I think having Patterson there is a good move. Let me ask you this question, because I need a deep breath on this one. I told you yesterday that I am quite excited about this kickoff rule, because I don't think it's too gimmicky, but I do think it provides what we haven't in the past, a <clears> wasted <throat> overall play. And it's apparent they're not going to get rid of the kickoff and just place the ball at the 25-yard line. But I saw maybe the repercussions of my love for this kickoff rule might come to fruition next year, and I'm in a panic mode. You know what I'm talking about? The Philadelphia Eagles, my team, I'm embarrassed to say right now they're my team, they have proposed repeatedly for the past couple of years. Forget about the onside kick. Let's go fourth and 20 to get it. You keep the football. I, it, it's the, maybe the worst rule I've ever heard of in my life, and it might gain traction now. Why? Because there's no more kickoffs in football. So the fact of the matter is the mm. Eagles rule might get put into play because the kickoff rule came into play this year. Please tell me, Joe. Like I, I don't want to see the gimmicks that we have in the NBA's timeout rule to move it in the front court to penalize the football team. We can't do it. Please tell me the Eagles aren't going to get this pushed across the goal line like the tush push. Enough. Nothing. And I mean, absolutely nothing would surprise me uh, at this particular point, uh, because they are not really. It's interesting, Donnie, the decisions and the rules that they're making, they're not they're not talking to the players. They're not figuring out uh, how to make the game better from the player's perspective. Uh, Stop Mm. telling me about safety. It's not about safety. It's about money. That's all it's about. And this is what you think will make you more money. More money, class action lawsuits. The guy to talk to is Rick Harrell coming up next. Class action lawsuit against the NFL. Mm. I'm leading the way. Let's go. We'll be right back. Michigan State looked good. We were like, oh my gosh, I mean, it's far to win the title. Uh, North Carolina beat a team who's barely beaten any good teams all year Ooh. long. But I was expecting it. Not a great three-point shooting team at about 139th in the country, shooting about 35% as a team. But the one thing we know about Marquette's defense, the three-point line is vulnerable for them. Only on Sports Grid. Gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports grid. 
your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smarty. Winning back-to-back road games. I I don't care if they're playing Topeka High. I I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game live. Prime time. Back-to-back just utterly stinker quarters. In-game live. Overtime. Honestly, as as you sit here and listen, watch right now, you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Right back at it here at hour number two. And oh, do we have a segment ready for you? I'm Donnie Wright side. He is Joe Ranieri. He's welcome on the Sports Business Professor right here on the Sports Grid Network. It's Rick Haro on a glorious Wednesday morning as we anticipate Major League Baseball opening day. Rick, how are we feeling today? Glorious in South Florida until I knew that Ranieri was about 600 yards away from me. Then it's a little less glorious. But we're gonna we're gonna re, we're gonna name this we're gonna rename this wrong side in Ranieri. I, I, I love the segment. Yeah. I love the title of the show. You heard it here first. Syndication. <laughs> you can be our agent. Syndication possibilities. We can get those yeah, royalties boy. rolling in. All now, right. let's talk about some there will be lawyer efforts here. Shohei Otani, no big deal. Four and a half million dollars disappears here. We have multiple story changes. Rick, what is the latest on Shohei Otani and Major League Baseball with their quote unquote investigation? Uh, he changed his story late last night. You didn't hear it. Now he said, he Uh-oh. never signed with the Dodgers. He's going to go back to Tokyo, ah. and uh, and he never bet. He didn't even know how to bet. <laughs> no. See, here, here's, the, here's the problem with all of this. Nobody knows. I will say nobody knows. And the storyline is, as we know, the interpreter is not going to talk to the Dodgers because he's been fired. He has no obligation to do it. The investigation, Major League Baseball, will maybe get to the bottom of it, but the FBI – and the Securities and Exchange Commission and all of the federal organizations that arguably have jurisdiction are now going to find out in the old Nixon terms how much he knew and when he knew it. And the bottom line is nobody knows now. And anybody that speculates right now is just doing a disservice because we know two things. One, because of the zero tolerance policy, if it's decided that there is any indirect or direct gambling on Otani's hands, Manfred's got one of the biggest decisions in his career Mm. about what to do about it. And then second is a lot of lawyering, which is good for me. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Let me just say, by the way, this is the best looking show on all of sports grid right now. Like this panel here is just phenomenal. Rick Haro. And by the way, Rick, I've got an insight on a, uh, on an NBA point prop uh, tonight. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, heard (laughs) here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. is the <laughs> I didn't, yeah, but I by didn't the even way, know by this way, guy me, played in the NBA. <laughs> and, and let me and let me interrupt you. You and he, I don't know him, but you could probably beat him one on one, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly. 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 Yeah, Unders, yeah, right, exactly. Unreal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. What's the latest so, with uh, it? Yeah, the latest with it is this that that uh, the NBA will no <laughs> doubt uh, make a an example. You know, the Otani thing, tread carefully. He is an icon uh, in the world of baseball. Mm. Uh, this guy, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, <laughs> how, how do you spell sacrificial lamb? I can hear the bleating of the lamb right now. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I'm gone. I'll 
uh, maybe I'll uh, go play. Uh, maybe I'll go play basketball in in jail if I if I can. It's not going to be that bad. But I will say that just like uh, the old uh, Calvin Ridley uh, suspension uh, uh, a year mm. and a half ago, you got to make an example on a zero tolerance situation where betting is the order of the day. We understand that now we cross the Rubicon. Remember my comments last week. We have more states. We meaning more people in the United States now eligible to bet than we have not eligible to bet first time and it's going that way and so you got to make sure integrity carries the day and somebody who won't make a 30-man roster let a uh, let alone a a 12-man <laughs> roster defining prop bets and talking about it uh there's no, no room for the nba in that rick new age and new money for the mm. nfl we had you on earlier when we talked about last year's the nfl christmas day game they got those ratings back and we looked forward and we said you know what christmas day is on a wednesday the following year and i believe you told us yeah get ready for nfl football not one game but a double header on a wednesday let's start there the nfl mm. when they see ratings that high they will move mountains to make sure they play games on wednesdays now it's incredible but hey it's all about that almighty dollar well, the NBA breathed a sigh of relief for about two months when they looked at the calendar and realized that oh. Sunday Christmas is Christmas won't come along every time. But wait, Roger Goodell says, yeah, you know, Wednesdays are a day of rest and we're not going to do it. But now he looks at the economics and say, well, when Wednesdays fall on Christmas, yeah, we'll do it. And then the NBA is saying, oh, boy, our worst nightmare. We can't have a day alone. Let's look at Martin Luther King Day, because maybe mm. that's a day where we can have it alone. No, NBA or NFL now maybe has their playoff oh, doubleheader for three days in a row that weekend. Point is, no, uh, no day, no, uh, no day is safe from what the NFL wants to do. And frankly, if they put a line on it, I know that means they're going to expand it over time. That's just the way businesses are, not just the NFL, but also means that uh, there is some opportunity to do this. Friday night football, Black Friday. Uh, now, what about Wednesdays before Thanksgiving? Mm -hmm. How about a Wednesday of Christmas when it falls on it? But that's only every seven years. That's not enough. How about a Wednesday before Thanksgiving? Hashtag make it happen. Here it is here. Mm. So if, I'm guessing, Rick, the end result of last year's deal with Amazon and having the Amazon games, uh, people eventually get used to anything because they're having a wild card game now as well they're going to host? Yeah, but let's remember the other thing, too. Uh, the, uh, the Eagles are playing their opening game in Brazil, and that's going to be oh. on a, uh, a, a non-traditional carrier. And so there are opportunities mm. to define the one-offs as they're created and give those rights to the uh, outlier network. We don't call them outliers anymore. How dare we call uh, Amazon an outlier? Uh, we will uh, have our uh, uh, Christmas or Easter packages delayed five days if we call an outlier. But we got Google, we've got all of these other entities. And why is that important just to remember? Because that drives up the rights deals with the traditional NBC, CBS, uh, Disney slash ABC and Fox, because they understand that these guys, just like DirecTV did, are ready to poach. It's business, but they've been mm. wonderful, NBA, NFL, in creating an opportunity for these networks to understand how the bidding works in the NFL, give them a carrot, then it turns into a carrot forest. Is it a carrot forest? <laughs> Probably not, but it's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Tons of carrots here. Talking about more money for the NFL here. Hard Knocks has been around for close to, what, 25 years mm. now. Originally, I believe it was with the Baltimore Ravens. Got high ratings. A little bit stagnant as you moved forward over the next two decades. But it looks like Hard Knocks trying to change things up, Rick. Instead of going for one team, they're actually going to go with one division, mm. which I think is a unique approach here. Well, it's a unique approach because it's a different way of storytelling. Uh, then you maximize yeah. the number of characters who are about to get cut or about to lead uh, their uh, their respective teams uh, by four. Uh, and, and so look at what's happening as far as the storytelling, not just HBO but or Max, but, but you know, Netflix, uh, Drive to Survive, uh, NASCAR's storytelling show has mm. led to increased ratings. Tennis's has not because they haven't granted the insiders. We didn't see Zverev. We didn't see uh, Kyrgios. Uh, but obviously, full swing is big. So the story is just bigger than hard knocks. It's 
if you want to appeal to the casual fan and those that really don't know that particular sport, tell the story about the sport from unique angles. And if you do it in preseason or in summer camp, you know you're going to have some people getting cut and throwing their playbooks against the locker and saying, I'm done with this. That's great television. Yeah, there you fantastic go. television. As long as, it's not, as long as it's not with the Jets, I'm just going to say it. As long as it's not with yeah, the Jets, well, we're good. Well, but the Jets have the ability to make the wrong decision, and that'll play out later in the year. And you know that. We understand that. Exactly. Rick, let me ask you this one final question, and we'll give you that long runway right into the break here. Jimmy Haslam wants a downtown dome stadium in Cleveland. Does he have your number on speed dial? Go ahead. Oh, uh, there are a lot of them, but Buffalo was first, and then there are some other ones. Look, I am not taking just – there are a lot of fish in the sea, and a downtown stadium in Cleveland may make some sense. The dome downtown mm. notion, just like Chicago, is important because that allows Super Bowls, that allows Final Fours, mm. that allows the economic impact mm. post-coronavirus recovery, and that's the way you get these kind of facilities done in the hard times now of recovery and if you want my number you guys do it but if you want something a little less appealing you guys come back after the break and everybody will listen to you bye Michigan State looked good. We were like, oh my gosh, I mean, Sparta to win the title. Uh, North Carolina beat a team who's barely beaten any good teams all year long. But I was expecting it. Not a great three-point shooting team, but about 139th in the country, shooting about 35% as a team. But the one thing we know about Marquette's defense, the three-point line is vulnerable for them. Only on Sports Grid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. What I've heard you say on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game, live, all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back-to-back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka high. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game, live, prime time. Back-to-back, just utterly stinker quarters. In-game, live, overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now. You may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid.
Having a blast here in hour number two. Tons of guests, tons of fun here, right here on the Early Line Series XM Channel 159. I'm Donnie Wrightside. He's Joe Ranier. we got a special guest for you right now. It's Ladarius Henderson. Let me paint the picture for you. 6'4", 309. He's a Michigan man, and when they say put a ring on it, he's got one because he is a national champion. Welcome into the show, Ladarius. Thanks for having me, national champs, baby. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good stuff, man. I mean, look. I didn't even get to the playoffs in high school. In college, my team was terrible. You're out here, you know, cashing checks with the NIL, winning national championships, playing under hardball, fantastic time. So let's start right there. You ended, you started at Arizona State. Then you came over in the transfer portal to Michigan. But I love the quote I read for you while you came over. You basically said, I want to play with the best. I want to challenge with the best. I want to go to yeah. what that offensive line is about. You end up starting at left tackle here. I love that confidence. Yeah, I mean, my mindset going into that was really, uh, if I can't start at the University of Michigan and play there, then how will I ever play in the NFL if I can't get past college, you know? So um, I wasn't going to turn down an opportunity of a lifetime like that to play for Coach Harbaugh and play for a national championship, you know, just off of a little competition. So I loved it. I, I loved the entire time I was there. Let me ask you, though, take us back. How did this start? Because you, you were at Arizona State, I guess, Coach Herm Edwards uh, at that point. W where'd you go to high school, and how did you eventually end up as a national champion of Michigan? So I actually went to high school in Waxahachie, Texas. It's a small town. Mm -hmm. I started playing uh, football in 11th grade, and I got recruited. Um, Arizona State was one of the teams that recruited me. Went there, started my true freshman year. I was 17. And I uh, played Oof. four years there, got to be the captain, and I hit the transfer portal after this past year. Uh, I didn't really feel like I could get much more out of Arizona State. And, hey, I think I, I, think I hit the lottery with that decision. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome stuff overall. <laughs> National great. championship. So let's go through that season because the one thing that we knew, Jim Harbaugh was sticking around because he knew he was a Michigan man looking for the players that he wanted under him. And the way he built that program was fantastic. Almost old school football. Give me a dominant offensive line. Give me a dominant running back in the backfield. Let's play strong defense. Just day to day being around Coach Harbaugh. What was that like for you, Ladarius? I mean, you, you learn so much football because this is this is a guy who, like, lives, eats, breathes football. That's what he thinks about. I'm sure he wakes up and goes to sleep thinking about football. And he also believes in, like you said, that old school mentality of, yeah, we can, we can do all this new tricky stuff or we can stick to the bread and butter of what football is and being aggressive and the more, more aggressive and dominant team wins. You got to win at the line of scrimmage. And although he's such a football mind, he does believe all of those, you know, old school, quote unquote, old school um, philosophy. So it was great being around him and learning a lot from him, to be honest. Yeah, and I, I, it's no wonder, I mean, speaking with you here, it's no wonder that Michigan is a national champion. You guys had to endure a lot this past season oh, yeah. there. I mean, you came in, right? I mean, adversity, guys that had been so close and didn't. I mean, it, you guys look like the most focused group I think I have seen in years in college football. What was it like in that locker room? Oh, man, it was so – honestly, man, Coach Harbaugh says it was spiritual, man. But uh, it's, no. it's really stuff of legends just to, like, go in there when thing – when. When adversity strikes thing after thing after thing and just the resiliency of the team, because don't get me wrong, like, I went to Arizona State. I've been in locker rooms where winning just wasn't about to happen. Like I've come in the building yeah. after a, a five game, a five a five game losing streak and everybody looks like zombies. And, um, you know, people are not used to playing 15 games in college all the time. And the, the when you see us coming to the building with so much juice and so much just vigor to win, Wow. And just even with every little adversity we'll just hit, like, I feel like we were so headstrong in our ability to deal with it just based off of kind of how our offseason went with uh, Coach Ben Herbert. But it was different, man. It's, it's hard to explain, but it was different. <laughs> 
Yeah, it was mm. Michigan against the world, which was interesting. You guys knew how talented yeah. you were, but the adversity, as Joe pointed out, was there all along. Now, here's the key component. Jim Harbaugh leaves the University of Michigan, a national championship, and goes out there to Los Angeles to be a head coach in the NFL. But I think you guys are in great hands with Sharon Moore. I mean, what he showed in those games of absence, uh-huh. particularly the emotion that he showed. When you guys got that monster win at Penn State, you knew he was the man for the job. Talk about yep. Michigan being left in the hands of Sharon Moore in the future there for the boys. I've been around a lot of great people, a lot of great football minds, and I don't know if I've been around a smarter, more intelligent football mind than Coach Jerome Moore. Um, I I don't think there could have been a better person to get that job. I don't know if they interviewed anybody else, but, I mean, if you interviewed for that job, you wasted your time because this guy Mm -hmm. was the man for the job. We knew it definitely after the Penn State game, but we kind of knew it all year long, even before that. But just some of the things that he does, or he, I, this is what I knew. I'll give I'll give you guys this. Um, so we're we're it's Penn State, and the, we're not ahead by a lot yet. So it's still the point where every snap still matters a lot for the win or the loss. And it's like third and eleven, and he calls a timeout. And we're over there in the huddle, and you see, like, the drone circling us, and this is the point where we're covering <laughs> up. <laughs> we're kind, yep, kind of making yep. a mockery of uh, the cheating thing, but um, mm-hmm. we're covering it up. <laughs> and he gives all 11 of us a specific assignment that's not just football. We have, we have not practiced it this way, but it was also acting. This is what I want you to do so that they think this is coming. And I know that their defensive coordinator, Manny Diaz, will think that this is about to happen. So he'll check out of this mm. and get into this. And so then we run this run play, even though they think we're doing a full slide pass protection. It should be wide open and it should be a touchdown. And we had 20 yards to go. And Donovan Edwards runs in for a 20-yard rushing touchdown on third and 11. So... Just things like that. It, not too many people think the way he thinks. So, Wow. In-game adjustments. Go figure. You got to love it. <laughs> uh, again, you want to know why Michigan's a national champion? Here you go. It's pretty simple uh, as far as that goes. I'm fascinated that you spent four years at Arizona State as a guard, and then you come to Michigan, and you got to make the – how big a switch was that for you to have to go to tackle? Well, I played left tackle my true freshman year at uh, Arizona State, which although – and I played in, for two years in high school, and then I played three years of guard. But although um, <laughs> although Pac-12 isn't Big Ten all the time, playing at 17 right. years old, it, it might as well have been the NFL because it, <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so then I felt like when I experienced that, I wasn't going to go through many more things in college that were harder than that. So um, I just kind of going back to just studying the game and studying top left tackles and just seeing the footwork and picking the brains of guys that do it at a high level like Rashawn Slater. I felt pretty prepared to make that switch again uh, going into my last year of college. We're talking mm. with Ladarius Henders, the national championship college football player at the University of Michigan, now entering into the NFL, which is a great way to start. And by the way, in that Penn State game, I believe in that second half, you basically said, you can't stop our running game. Good luck. We're going to run it right down your throats, which I know offensive linemen mm-hmm. absolutely love. But let's talk about some of the love changes it. here. Leaving Michigan, mm. heading into the NFL, or at least the draft process. How's it been for you, Ladarius? Uh, I mean, it's been... It's been a mixed emotions. Um, obviously, you're like, man, this college football thing's over, but this is kind. Of, this is what you've been dreaming of. Like I said, I started playing football late, so it's not like I had this dream to be a college football player my entire life. Um, when I started playing, I wanted to be an NFL player. So this is like mm. what what you've been looking forward to. You're so blessed to be a part of it, and but at the same time, I've never really been a guy that's dealt with many injuries, and um, this in this job process i just have been having like little small things that aren't like detrimental at all but they stop you from doing like little things that you need to do for this process so it's been kind of annoying dealing with little knickknack things from a late season but um man i just really can't complain at all i really can't like this is what i've been wanting to do for years now so man i really can't complain 
national champion man uh, that they mm-hmm. never take that away from him man national champion <laughs> yeah. you'll always uh, you'll always be that uh at michigan here uh it's not just you i mean a number of michigan guys including your quarterback jj mccarthy uh also uh getting ready for the draft here so uh what was it like playing with him uh you know he was your quarterback he was your leader oh man i don't think people I think he's starting to get a little bit more of the credit he deserves, but I also don't feel like it's um, as much or as much credit as he truly deserves. I mean, yeah, we weren't in an air raid offense where JJ's throwing 50 passes a game. However, um, the things that he did do for us, he did at a high level, and the way he led our team and the way he, you know, rejected passivity when it needed to be rejected and just, was the alpha male quarterback leader that this team needed to win a national championship and bring the best out of all 22. I feel like J.J. McCarthy did that at a high level. And let, let's talk about how accurate he is. I just think he's he did a phenomenal job, and he's a heck of a quarterback. So I think people are starting to realize that. You don't have to have every stat in the stat book to be a good football player. But, um, hey, I think he's amazing. Yeah, Amen. he's been rising up those draft boards as well, which hopefully, Ladaris, you are rising up those draft boards as well, heading into the NFL. We had some time having some fun here talking with Ladarius Henderson, a Michigan man, national champion on his way into the NFL. Thank you for joining us this morning, Ladarius. Thank y'all for having me. It was awesome. Fantastic stuff all the way through. Good luck to him in that draft process as we move forward. But we have a lot more to get to on the show today, which includes Mark Zeno coming up next to talk some college basketball. Stay tuned right here on The Early Line. State looked good. We were like, oh my gosh, I mean, it's far to win the title. Uh, North Carolina beat a team who's barely beaten any good teams all year Ooh. long. But I was expecting it. Not a great three-point shooting team at about 139th in the country, shooting about 35% as a team. But the one thing we know about Marquette's defense, the three-point line is vulnerable for them. Only on Sports Grid. gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFC selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows that QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back-to-back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka High. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game live. Prime time. Back-to-back just utterly stinker quarters. In-game live. Overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now. You may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid.
an action-packed edition of the early line only gets better here. Guess, guess, more guess, more picks, more fun. That's what we do here. I'm Donnie Wright, said he's Joe Ranieri, and the man in the middle right now. He is the mouth in the south. It is Mark Sino as we get ready to approach some college basketball. Mark, how are we feeling on this glorious Wednesday morning? Uh, we are good. Uh, uh, I tried to get Uh-oh. to last night and play a first-half play with Indiana State, and it ruined my perfect NIT record. As Joe Ranieri has heard me brag about often this year, uh, my perfect <laughs> NIT record is my NCAA tournament record of betting underdogs in the round of 32 got absolutely destroyed. So there's that. But we press on. We look forward to the Sweet 16, and we keep going here. There you go. No cream Abdul-Jabbar here in the big tournament, in the big dance, yeah. but there also are some very good teams in the tournament still left. Why? Because it's been a chalky tournament moving forward. The Sweet 16 and Lee 8 this weekend should be absolutely fantastic. So, Mark, let's start there first. If we're just taking a look at price points here, UConn down to a plus 220 price, followed by Houston at plus 550, and Purdue now down to a 550 price. If we look at the top end of that bracket, is there still some money to be made if you're betting Connecticut, Houston, and Purdue now that we're in the Sweet 16 to cut down the Nets and win a national championship? Yeah, I still think we're undervaluing Purdue. Um, I, I don't know if we're giving him enough credit. I've said this several times. I've never seen a college player of Zach Eady's status who is as good as he is and as consistent as he is and a guy who looks like he's going to translate easily to the next level and get dumped on and crapped on more than Zach Eady because they lost to a 16 seed and because – they haven't really reached their full potential. but uh, And I'm not saying they're necessarily going to win it this year per se, but I still think that's an undervalued team. Uh, they have the easiest path to the Final Four of anybody left uh, in this tournament of, of, the, of the four brackets that are there, and they're going to be a really tough out. They, they can only beat themselves. Put it this way, Donnie. I don't think there's a team that will beat them. If they end up losing a game, it's because they played poorly. They didn't do the things that they needed to do. They missed shots and, and couldn't get rebounds and things of that nature. You'll see an anomaly for Purdue to get knocked out of this tournament. It feels like they are slowly, uh, by the time tip-off comes, they're going to be that trendy dog, uh, the Gonzaga team, right, uh, going up against Purdue. And I'm kind of with you here. It's like – why are we I, – I, Matt Painter, I hope uh, he gets sick, doesn't show up for the game, and we can take that out of the equation. Would be fantastic. Uh, but that would scare me here with uh, with Gonzaga, who's had a great run, but my goodness, it feels like the public's just all over them. They are. And, and here's what you're going to notice, guys, because of what happened in the round of 32 when odds makers and, and books got destroyed with the favorites all going 15 and one straight up. And, you know, subsequently, I think they would, would they end up going uh, uh, 14 and, and four, whatever it was, um, or 14 and two in the uh, yep. 18s. So uh, you're going to see them hold to this five and a half line. They're not going to move off of it. Uh, they're going to stay right there. They're not going to bring it down. Um, because I think they know what I know, and that's Purdue is the better team. And Purdue is the one bet that I've locked in already uh, for the Sweet 16. I have that much confidence in this team right now. And I'll give you one more tip, guys, the way I'm approaching the Sweet 16. Similar to the NFL playoffs, I don't think the spread is going to matter. I think the favorite's going to win handily. The dog is going to win outright. Just pick the winner of the game and bet that. If you're taking the dog, sprinkle a little bit on the money line as well because I think that's the way a lot of these games are going to go. When you get to this level of comparable talent and you only have one double-digit seed, thank God, because I'm not a big fan of all these Cinderella's getting to this point. But nonetheless, even that double-digit team is a Power 5 team. It's not a you know smaller school. It's a, it's a team that's used to playing legitimate competition. So uh, outside of Clemson and, and NC State, you're getting high-level programs playing against other high-level programs. Just pick the winner, ignore the spread. Making Mm. adjustments in the tournament here is what most handicappers will do in order to make money. Before the tournament started, I was down, Mark, on the ACC. I figured it was a one-team league with North Carolina. Now, granted, North Carolina looks very good early on. Wasn't that high on Duke, specifically NC State? Oh, when's their run going to come then? They're still continuing. And then you find Clemson here making a run as well. So the question I want to ask you is, after watching the first two rounds of the tournament, is there a team that maybe you were a little bit lower on that's starting to rise up the board for you, maybe can make you some money? Well, look, uh, let me preface what you're saying by saying this, and I've said this repeatedly. Nothing any team does in the tournament validates or invalidates whether they belong there. They are completely Mm. unrelated events. The resume you put together (laughs) to get into the tournament, even Virginia, the resume they put in to get into the tournament, because they got smoked in their first-round game, 
does not invalidate them being there. I know we all didn't believe that they belong there. I was the one who said they didn't belong there. But I didn't believe the reason that they lost wasn't because they didn't belong in the tournament. They got in. They, if they play a different opponent, the outcome might be completely different with a different seed. So I, I, I can't stand people trying to do that. Oh, well, the ACC still had a down year, Donnie. There's no denying that. There's literally no mm-hmm. denying that the ACC had a down year. So I don't care what NC State did. That doesn't say that the, NC, that the ACC had a great year. They didn't. Anyway, now to answer your question. The team I think that we're not really getting enough value on at this point in time, honestly, and I scratch my head at it because if you bring up those odds to win the national championship again, is North Carolina the one seed? You're still getting better than 10 to 1 at a lot of shops. Like, mm-hmm. they're the number one seed. Arizona's mm-hmm. a two seed in that bracket. I mean, it already tells you that if Arizona and UNC both win, Arizona's a two and a half, three point favorite in that game. But when you're getting like 13 to 1, as those odds showed for the North Carolina Tar Heels, who have looked very, very impressive to this point, um, to, to not you know, to win the national title, I think is, is fantastic number. I mean, I, I don't know that you're going to at this point, find any better odds for a one seed, right? I mean, 10 to one for any one seed to get to this point, if they get there, you're looking at two coin flip games, especially if UConn gets bounced out by San Diego state or either uh, Iowa state on the way out of the door. So uh, I think it's very legitimate that North Carolina has a shot to get to the finals. And at that point you're hedging. Thought it was crazy too that we've never had a tournament winner west of Baylor since 1997. So the Arizonas of the world, the the Pac-12, the Cal, have never actually won a tournament since 1997, which is bonkers. It's been all either Texas or uh, Kansas uh, east of that. Uh, knowing that, Donnie, which is going to be of the four number ones left here in the Sweet 16? Which one loses first? I mean, could UConn really get bounced? Like, I mean, <laughs> yes. I know where- yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think so. <laughs> but I, I mean, look, if there was a team left that could do it because of the style of defense that they play, look, and I don't think San Diego State's defense this year is as good as it was last year. That said, you know, this is clearly a big revenge matchup of last year's national title game. And, and does San Diego State have something in, up their sleeve that they figured out from the last time these two teams played? At this high of a level, uh, I don't know. But, look, if UConn's going to get bounced, it's probably going to be in this game, right? Like, I I think they could overpower Iowa State as much as my Iowa State future would be burned to shreds. But I I think they're probably too much for Iowa State. And then once they get to the Final Four, it's their tournament to lose. So this is the spot where they have to get tripped up, where a team has four or five days to prepare for them. They've seen them before. It's not their first go-around with it. Like, this may Mm. be the one true hurdle that UConn has to clear here to get through. Um, and I think, the, you know, obviously the other most vulnerable one is Purdue just because we have this narrative out there that they're Purdue and they're going to lose. So uh, mm. I, I buy into narratives that much, but that's probably what most of the public will tell you that Purdue is likely the most, uh, the highest one seed to lose. Take a look at some of these Thursday night games here, 939 tip time on the West Coast. That's going to be Alabama and North Carolina. We are expecting points here, Mark. A total at the FanDuel Sportsbook lining up at 173 and a half. We don't usually see these type of numbers here. So from a handicapping perspective, when you look at that 173 and a half in an NCAA tournament game on a neutral court site here, what do you make of that? Does he say, you know what, tempo makes sense, I'll take the over? Or is there a general thought that, wow, that's a lot of points. I can't take that over. I, you know, when I look at the – the first thing that jumped out to me when I looked at the game, Donnie, I don't want to avoid your question about the total, but yeah, uh, this is too many points. Like, hasn't Alabama been power rated higher than North Carolina all year long? Right? Like, I mean, yeah. I, I get that their defense has been a problem. And, look, we, sometimes we do this in college basketball. We see one game and we hang our hats on it, right? Like, uh, we, we, we saw Alabama get rolled by Kentucky where they scored 110 points in regulation and all of a sudden – well, Alabama stinks. They can't play. Their defense is terrible. Um, no, they're still a really good team. They've been in Ken Palm in the top 10 the entire year. So, you know, that's a narrative you can try to create, but it's not reality. There's an argument to say Alabama's been a better team all year long than North Carolina, and they should probably be favored. Like, that's what jumped out to me. Now, to answer your question about the total, um, if Alabama's going to win this game, I, I wouldn't go back to the well with them scoring 65 points like they did against Grand Canyon saying they're going to do that two games in a row and win a basketball game. 
I mean, it's purely correlated yeah. here that this thing goes over. It's in Alabama's favor. Uh, if, it, if somehow North Carolina can slow them down and not let them make shots, then, you know, North Carolina is going to have a, 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 a grip on this game that's going to be hard to, uh, to let go. So uh, I, I played the under in at 173 in Alabama's first matchup against College of Charleston because I'm an idiot, and I just like the contrarian play there with a total that was that high that we hadn't seen in 30 years. So I figured it would go under. Uh, it did not, but I, I would tend to think here this thing goes over regardless. Uh, there's certainly a way where it can go over and North Carolina can win, but I don't think there's a way that this thing stays under and Alabama wins. So which one inevitably there's going to be one dog that barks and wins outright uh, this week. So who who is it? Who do you give the best shot to actually outright win on the money line plus money? Get it done. As frustrating as it is, because I bet against them last round. In fact, I bet against them in the first round. I bet against them in the second round. And I have a future going on Arizona. So I'm technically <laughs> Again, but if the Clemson Tigers continue to shoot 56% from the field, they're going to beat everybody they're going to play. That's just the reality of the situation. Like, I don't know how to lay it out any clearer than that. Clemson is not a really great team. They're a good team, but they're not a team that shoots 55, 56% for any extended stretch this year. If they somehow can carry it over to the Sweet 16, they're not going to lose. There's not. Um, they, they have enough talent and enough athleticism and enough size. Um, you know, this – but also walked into UNC and beat them, walked into Duke and beat them, right? So they're, they're battle-tested from that standpoint. They're not scared of anybody. But if they're going to shoot at the level that they did against New Mexico and against Baylor, they're, they're going to knock Arizona off, guys. Mm. Friday night, also Sweet 16, four games across the landscape. NC State, Marquette, Gonzaga versus Purdue, Duke, Houston, and Creighton, Tennessee. Of those four games on Friday, what has your eye here, Mark? Well, I mean, Marquette is a team that – also another team I have a future on. I just only, only have three left after Auburn got burned out in the first round. Um, but Marquette's an interesting team to me. I think – I've been high on them all year long. I've had several conversations with people in the industry. I think they're underrated. I think they're every bit as good as UConn. And, and had they been healthy and had Tyler Kolick been healthy in that final matchup, they beat UConn. Um, this is a very talented team. And Tyler Kolick, now that he's back, is starting to get in the fold. I think two games under the belt of really sort of, you know – got them back to a place where they were earlier in the year where they were a top five team in the country. Um, they are extremely good at shooting the basketball. They're very, very fast and athletic on defense. This is a team that does it very well on both ends of the floor. So I think Marquette gets past, um, gets past that first round. Houston is interesting because this is another team that like, if they don't get tripped up here, they're probably in the final four, but this is a styles make fights kind of matchup here against Duke. You know, it's their defense versus the Duke's offense. They, shoot uh, and could shoot the three and be really, really good from a scoring standpoint. Uh, you'll find out pretty quick, I think, in the first five minutes who's going to come out on top in that game. I love it. I'm with Mark here. Like, a lot of us love upsets when they happen in the moment, but then we realize what those upsets mean in the Sweet 16, Elite Eight, and the Final mm -hmm. Four. We're like, where are the blue bloods in the big-time programs? <laughs> we got great college basketball. Thanks to Mark Zeno for joining us this morning on a Wednesday to break it all down. Much more left on the program. Don't go anywhere. It's the early line. Michigan State looked good. Oh my gosh, it's far to win the title. Uh, North Carolina beat a team who's barely beaten any good teams all year long. But I was expecting it. Not a great three-point shooting team at about 139th in the country, shooting about 35% as a team. But the one thing we know about Marquette's defense, the three-point line is vulnerable for them. Only on Sports Grid. Gut says Miami is going to win, and you should take the over. 
Your gutter also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. What we've heard you say on the network is you're either winning your rebuild in game live all access nobody has been more profitable as a dog than shaka smart team winning back-to-back road games i, I don't care if they're playing topeka high i i wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever in game live prime time to back just utterly stinker quarters in game live overtime honestly as, as you sit here and listen watch right now you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Final segment of hour number two, and what a packed hour number two it was. Great guests all the way through, covered the board on just about everything you want. But now, as always, during this segment, Joe Ranieri, we like to pull the public in with us here with a Fade the Public poll today at Sports Grid TV on Twitter slash X. Which teams will make the NBA playoffs? Now, there were a couple options here. There were two teams listed, and then a both and a neither. So shout out to Stamp behind the scenes trying to confuse everybody overall on this mm-hmm. poll to see what we can actually shake loose. Those two teams, Lakers and the Warriors in the Western Conference. The question was asked, which one of those teams can make it in and or teams? If you voted Lakers and Warriors, congratulations. If you voted both, they both get in? Ah, congratulations. If you voted neither, which means none of them get in, maybe both is the big winner at that point here. But looking at the overall votes coming in, pretty easy. 31% on the Lakers, 16% on the Warriors. Both of them to make it in, 33%. Neither at 18%. It's a split, Joe Ranieri, across the board. I voted both teams get in. How did you vote in this poll here, Joe? Well, I, I find this uh, this poll interesting because what it tells me here, Donnie, just by the amount of votes that we have gotten, is that that is the definition of mediocrity. You You have a 50-50 split down the board with two teams, that there is no clear winner, which means I could see I voted both not making it because that's how me that that's what this poll tells us is that nobody uh, is a clear cut favorite here one way or the other. When we get to will they or won't they get in? Usually I like to bet they won't because they're not good enough to get in at this point. Oh, I do like these polls the day after because you had big wins by the Lakers and the Warriors oh, yesterday. Yeah. I would have been interested to see if this poll, if the Lakers had lost yesterday, more importantly, the Warriors, who were teetering on that 10 line, would have lost if any of those votes would have changed. Now, for my money here, once we get back from the break in hour number three, I'm going to explain why I do think that Lakers-Warriors is very interesting, but for maybe different mm. reasons of what happened on the basketball court here. So I'll have some fun with that, but a monster hour number three coming up. If you like the first two hours, you're loving hour number three. Joe Ranier, it's Donnie Right Side. It's the early line on a Wednesday morning. Where would you rather be? Come on back.
smarter to be on sports grid.